Rob Seymour, General Manager, Regional Optus. Firstly, thank you so much for coming on to Voitech Connect Thanks and being me. a great partner of um, Voitech. Now, you, your role is to manage the Optus Regional Development for South Australia. Mm -hmm. Now, that sounds like an all-encompassing role. Um, Rob, tell us all about it. What, what does it actually mean for you? Well, it, uh, you're right, it's, uh, it is a big role and it encompasses a, a raft of uh, responsibilities and roles and, and accountabilities. Um, if I dissect it up into the easy, easiest way I can, uh, it's to uh, look after, maintain and develop our distribution uh, points across the state. It's to look at where our network needs investment and, and further growth. Um, it's working with communities, with regional development boards, with local government, with state government, um, and making sure that we put the best possible uh, solution that we, that we can for uh, regional South Australia, or regional Australia, but my remit's only SA of course. Um, but there's 14 of me uh, across the across the nation, which is a little bit dangerous, maybe. But uh, in general, you know, it encompasses the the distribution, retail stores, um, partners such as you know Voitech, and assisting you guys and develop and make sure we build a model that not only you know brings the the awareness to the clients in the regional areas, but most importantly, you know, delivers a great experience and more and even more importantly, again. Is uh, provides an ongoing management layer as well, just to make sure that you know the, the largely forgotten regional areas of South Australia are uh, delivered a, a first a first class service at all times. So Optus has always had a pretty good network. Okay, so when when we're talking Optus within the city and um, outside the city, it's great. But you've now really pushed hard into the regional space. Why why is it important to you? Well, it's exciting times in that, uh, you know, since Optus inception in 1992, you know, and Optus is Latin for choice. Um, that's largely unknown. People don't drill right, into that. Wow. But, okay. uh, that. That's what Optus means. And uh, when, it, when it was launched in 92, I was around back then, um, what we did was we had a legislated, a legislated um, you know, price uh, differential against Telstra, but we also had access to their networks. So... That was there purely to encourage competition and try and break the monopoly that Australia had. Now, over many years since then, um, from a metropolitan area and obviously for commercial reasons, the investment was made to you know to build the network and make sure that it was a competitor from where the population is. Obviously, yes. you know, mainly metropolitan areas, you know, 65% of the population across Australia. And it's only been recently, um, and I'm talking, you know, the last two years that. Uh, significant investment has been made into regional regional areas we're talking you know over over three billion dollars invested wow. into it and uh from a pound for pound perspective we're now you know splitting hairs with regard to the the coverage areas i'd like to point out one of the one of the black arts of the telco world is uh they keep using numbers like you know 98 percent coverage now that that always comes back to the population and I think people ignore that, you know, they see the headline but don't go into the detail. And it's a faux pas that all telcos are guilty of, you know, uh, and it's not just Telstra, Optus have in the past done it also. But now by getting that clean and clear, concise message out into the, into the uh, market, and, and especially from my case, all, all I really care about is the regional areas, obviously, that's, that's my remit. Um, people out there haven't had choice, you know, mm -hmm. they, they've just not had it. it it's been a monopoly. And uh, it's a very exciting times that, that we're now in that there is a genuine option for people in regional areas. And back to your first question, I suppose, the biggest part of my job is creating awareness yes. and, and consideration. And when I, I say consideration, I mean people to even consider that Optus is an op a viable option for them in yeah. those regional areas. And uh, it is only recently that we've had staff on the ground, we've built up a team, to, to make sure that this job is done and done well. Um, so over, over the last 20 years, I've been involved in regional communications. There's been many attempts. Uh, I've done many of my own. Um, we've invested millions of dollars. However, there hasn't been a legitimate competitor. Now, the reason I took this role uh, was knowing that we had Singtel as a mothership behind it. Now, to break that monopoly that Telstra has in the regional areas, it 
absolutely took a significant player such as Singtel or someone of that ilk to really come in and, and push the barrier and, mm. uh, and we're doing it. So, you know, it, it, it seems to me though that it, it's not just a job to you. you. You've got a bit of country in your blood here, Rob. What, what, I love what, it. Why, is it. why are you so passionate about the regional space? Well, that's a real good question. Um, you know, I come from a regional area in New South Wales. I'm not a South Australian, but I've been here mm. since 1993. Um, I've been involved in many startups and with a, with a pure vision and mission to, to deliver services and choice to regional communications. And as I stated just previously, I've, um, I've spent many million dollars in my own money doing this. And we've had various layers of success. We've you know won awards, we've delivered industry first, the first WiMAX network in Australia, that was, wow. that was me. The first uh, video conference network uh, for universities and health was delivered via VSAT networks. That was in the early 90s. Um, so I've been involved in that. And, and I think it's in my DNA now because mm. I see the changes that we can make into these regional communities where, you know, previous, previous to this especially, um, there hasn't been a significant player that's able to wear the, you know, or weather the storm yes. of Telstra's counter, counter actions. Um, Telstra's a big beast. They, they take the, the protection of their market very seriously. Um, but I can assure you we're now, we're now, from a consideration perspective, we're doing it. We're winning really good deals around the place. Um, we're making a difference in regional communities. We're, we're delivering choice. We're saving people money. We're delivering greater value. And most importantly, we're delivering a better experience. So mm, mm. when it comes to that backup and, and what happens, it's, you know, everyone's got a phone and, you know, we all need a phone these days and strike, you know, striking the, the, the amount of mobile phones out there drilling exactly. down to now little kids yeah. of six and seven years of age, which which is a bit crazy. But, um, you know, previously it's, it's um, Telstra or nothing. But now mm. I'm extremely proud to be leading... Uh, this charge into you know, regional South Australia, but most importantly, all of Australia. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, it, it is in my DNA, and I've been doing it for so long now that um, I'm, I feel like I've got the best job in the world. I'm, Fantastic. I'm, I'm privileged, I'm, I'm proud, and mm. uh, yeah, it's a great time to be at Optus. No, good on you. Um, now, let's talk coverage for a moment. So, people talk coverage in a general term, yep. but the the movement is all about data or data, as people say over in these parts of the world. <laughs> data. Um, are we talking just a trickle a bit of data in these uh, regional areas, or Not what sort of experience could you get, or can you get right now? Oh, look. Uh, so the, back to those key stats, uh, the the official numbers. We're at ninety eight point one percent of the population right. coverage, and Telstra at ninety eight point three percent. There's a little bit of a black art into that because there's some other networks that are included into that where mm. largely there's no population anyway. Yes. I'm talking about the Indian Pacific rail line and those sorts of places. So if you take them out, it's, it's absolutely hair splitting uh, statistics right. and base stations and total number of, of uh, towers and, and cells, etc. Now, the, the focus has been to really ramp up and deliver coverage and choice into all the populated centres across the, the regional areas. And to that extent, we've done a, a fantastic job. Now, I will point out there are places that we're never going to have a, a mobile network, but there are other solutions for that, i.e. the sat cell and other devices that we can, mm. we can put into the market. But by and large, um, main arterials, the highways, everywhere that most people travel, um, you know, we've, we've got a, a service that enables high, def, high definition video uh, where, wherever you may be. Um, there are some known, known holes across the Air Peninsula, but we're working on those with the mobile black spot programs. So we, we had our biggest share of that uh, acceptance only this year. And that comes back to having the people on the ground driving the agenda. And most importantly, being transparent with the government at local, state and federal level to let them know where the where the network needs the investment most. And that's, gotcha. ne that's never been done before. And it's a really crucial part of my role. And I'm proud to, to have those relationships and, and to give that information over you know, in a transparent uh, yeah, fashion. Yeah. It only helps drive a better outcome. So- Rob, you seem to be avoiding my question. What sort of speed should I be receiving? Oh, mate, when, well, sorry, so back to when, the question. When I'm in Kimba, for well, instance, or in Cleve, actually, what in sort Cleve, of speed should I can, be getting? You can be pulling off, turn my phone off for this interview, but uh, I can show you data um, that's, that's real world, not smoke and mirrors. 
that anywhere from you know 50 megabit up to 250 megabit. Wow. So right. places like Venus Bay on the Air Peninsula, yeah, you know, yeah. a very small town, great fishing community, 255 megabit. And I got that feedback from a, a local constituent that they couldn't believe what he was getting. Wow. Um, places like Cleve, so, so we're 200 actually, megabit. We're, we're changing that world. We are. We so are indeed. previously to that sort of delivery, you, you'd be lucky to get low-end 3G services. And lucky to make it, a phone call, Declan. Yeah, wow. Lucky yeah. to make a phone call in many of these areas. So now... Having you know the ability to not just make a phone call from a you know a WHNS from an emergency services perspective, they, these are all real critical things to rural, rural, regional, remote areas. Yes, we're also able to deliver you know bandwidth and data speeds to them that enables them to actually participate in the global economy, and never before has that been able to be done. So, so we're very proud. So of if that. we take the macro view now of Australia yep. of trying to put people and embrace the regional communities and increase their population growth yep. what we're really talking about now is providing them with a platform where they can connect into the global economy correct so there's no reason why i couldn't take my web design studio my um, shop my bakery my call center and put it into a place like kimber for instance no reason at all so you know the good folk at kimber there were only there very recently yeah <clears throat> um that that network is just fantastic you know sitting there averaging 180 megabit you know 130 megabit you're sitting there saying wow i'm absolutely in the middle of australia and i'm receiving this sort of data speed yeah and that, that these are game changing you know and, and this is it, it is an essential service these days. It's a statutory essential service. So mm. in the past where, you know, roads, rail, rubbish, gas, you know, electricity, et cetera, you know, telecommunications is absolutely at the, at the forefront of what's required in these regional communities to not only stop the drain, but to, you know, encourage further entrepreneurship. Yeah, and, yeah. And make sure that, you know, there's, there's a lot of really cool stuff happening in these mm. regional areas that other... You know, otherwise people wouldn't know about yes. un unless they could gain access to suitable infrastructure and communications to enable them to participate in the global economy. So it's really so, exciting. So it's really like um, we're putting the first train station back into the regional communities. Uh, you're, you're delivering that railway line of yep. the technology era rather than the industrial era. It's pioneer stuff. It's mm. it's exciting and you, you see the look on people's faces with, mm. you, know, you know, I've got plenty of stories I can I can say one one in particular that that, that really warms my heart is uh, you know a, a particular um, family on the Air Peninsula no names obviously but uh, you know they, they send me messages almost every two days telling me something else that they've been able to do and you know hey I'm, I'm looking at this now like I'm, I'm seeing things like Netflix I'm able to watch which we just take you know, for granted applications we, yeah. we do and, and yeah you know, I live eight kilometres out of the CBD here and I can get a better service at Cleve, Kimber, Port Lincoln. Yes. You know, Mount Gambier than I can get at Roslyn Park. Wow. It's it's mind boggling how that occurs. Mm, and mm. don't don't be fooled, my, my daughters and my family and my friends give me a real hard time about it. But, mm. you know, it's I really don't care about what happens here in Metro because we've always had those services and yeah. being able to participate now for the first time ever we can do the same thing if not better in regional australia so it's a great time and from my memory you go a little bit further as well so i'll give an example back to you of there was a power outage uh, a wee while ago for south australia which is yep. quite significant yes um it got to the point that you're not just yours but the cellular infrastructure was falling down because it was losing power yep. Um, how would you address that going forward in the future? What would you work on for that? Well, another great question. Um, so what we did, we absolutely had a step back and had a look at what, what happened, you know, and, and, and communications and, and any sort of critical infrastructure has to have a, a, a balance of dimensioning and planning called the, the what happens when, not mm. what happens if. Yes, so, it's technology well, at the end of the technology day. Technology goes wrong. Yeah. Like anything that's got an electronic feed to it you yes. know, is susceptible to all sorts of elements, whether it be you know, acts of God, you know, storm floods, etc., fire, um, power outages, and, and heaven forbid, you know, South Australia's notoriously in the past 
um, had a really poor uh, reliability perspective from a, a, a electricity. An, electricity. Yeah, yeah. Now that's changing. Give credit where credit's due. The, uh, the state government and SA Power Networks are actually investing heavily to make sure that those never those uh, instances never happen again. Now, something to, that occurred to me in consultation with leaders of all of these communities, and this comes back to being there, being on the ground, and yeah. having these conversations, saying, you know, what could we do that that mm. would assist you? in times of crisis so the the thing that kept jumping out at me and it was it was absolutely you know universal every every conversation i had across all 60 councils was um the silence row you know when when we lost the power the biggest issue in our communities was the silence because there was a there was a fear factor so you had people on you know you know, not being cataclysmic, but you look at the health issues, people on yes. on monitored health um, yes. devices for their heart or whatever mm. other mm. ailments that they may have. People were, there was, the fear factor escalated. So the anxiety that was caused during those times was needless and unwarranted because all companies, whether it be us, our competitors, no one really planned for the what happens when factor. So part of that consultation allowed me to come back escalate back up into our executive leadership team or the, or the board of Optus. And so guys, I think that if we looked at this a little bit of a, in a little bit of a different light, we might be able to come up with something that gives us, you know, a, one, a, a better network. Yes. So a more reliable network and three, you know, competitive edge over yes. our competitors. So, you know, when, when I put it to them in that way and from the cost involved in, in, in enabling these backup suppliers, it was a drop in the ocean comparatively when you're talking about $3 billion compared to what's another million dollars to, to yeah. give you that layer of confidence. Mm. More importantly, peace of mind when you know our teams and our partners are out there talking up about the resilience and reliability of the network. You want to, have, you want to be going in and not being a forked tongue. You want to be yeah. there absolutely you know, squeaky and, and letting people know that you're there you mm. know, hand on heart and this is a true, true fact. So back to the consultation again, engaging with the, the, the councils, it was identified that they all had their own um, backup generators for, right, of course. for, for you know, times of crisis time. and, yeah. and, and whatever. Because so, that's you know, the resilience of those communities. They, they make it work for themselves. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Necessity is the mother of all creation. And, yes. and, and you see that firsthand um, mm. you know, in my role because we're out there. So. In that, in that conversation was, uh, they've got these things. What if we made our communications huts, which if you look at a standard tower, they've all got them, there's a tower and there's a box underneath yes. uh, of different shapes and sizes depending on the location. These things have all got you know dedicated power supplies. They've all got backup battery supplies. Now what happened in the past where we only had a phone network or a cellular network, not a data network, then the, the batteries would keep the things up for about 16 hours right. on average. Right. Now, depending on ages and life cycles, that could vary. Mm. But um, all of ours being new, you know, re relatively new, less than three years old, um, ours would still last. If it was just a telephone call, they'd still stay up for about 16 to 18 hours. Understand. Um, but with the advent of data network and social media and mm. you know, Facebook, Instagram, all of these things that, that people absolutely rely on these days with a mobile phone, that absolutely slammed the power supplies of these and really drained the batteries in record time. So we're talking four hours. Wow. And so <clears throat> that's not good enough because often is the case that due to the distances involved these power networks are out for anywhere as we saw in november 16 up to four days yes now so compensating for that with back to the conversation again we know we knew that they all had those generators on 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 hand and they also as as part of a stakeholder engagement making sure that we worked in collaboration with them they offered that to us um, in an emergency um, cycle so that was too good an opportunity to to, to not take up and it's there for all carriers. It's not just Optus, but we were the first ones to do it. And what we've done is just added an, an, an external power supply mm -hmm. off all of our comms huts in a secure fashion that, you know, Jimmy Jimmy off the street can't go near it. However, yeah. you know, SAPOL, CFS, SES, council CEO, works managers, people of trust and, yeah. and credibility and, trained and, to do it. and yeah. confidence and knowledge yeah. um, have the ability to go up Turn their gen set on and plug into our towers, 
to make sure that they have communications in times wow. of need. So very proud of that. Yeah, that's um, amazing. And, and it's a key area, not just not just for those times of crisis within those um, mm. within those areas. Um, it also um, contributes a long way to the state's disaster. Uh, I agree. Disaster plan. So you know, from a small conversation, we've made a hell of a lot of change, and. Um, you know, I'm very proud to have been involved, involved in that initiative. Because it, it, it has come down to the fundamentals of, at times of disaster, I need water, I need electricity, and I need my phone. Yep. And if we can now provide a solution where you can provide the phone, yes. the water and the electricity is already there. Because yes. most people in the bush or a regional, they probably have their own backup generator anyway. Most, um, most do, yeah. yeah. So now we're able to provide them with their phone as well, which yeah. is great. Yeah, it really is. Now, Rob, I want to change the story. I want you to put your futuristic hat on. Now, we've been talking oh, well. 5G and stuff like that that's been going on in our industry. What, what sort of applications, now people talk to me about IoT or the Internet of Things, what sort of applications do you think you're going to see in the regional areas going forward, or, or 5G in general? Well, uh, another good question. Um, 5G... And, and maybe explain 5G a little bit. Yeah, okay. Um, I'll, I'll try not to be too techy, and yeah. I'll, I'll stress that I'm not a tech. I'm, a, yeah, I'm not an engineer either. So... Um, in easy speak, 5G is the next evolution of the, the current networks that we have out there. So, you know, the, the instant headlines are, you know, driverless cars, robotics, artificial intelligence. So these are the things that we've been bombarded with uh, in the press and the media. Now, you know, I'll, I'll be careful with my words, but I'll be, uh, I'll be honest as I always am. Um, a lot of people in regional areas don't have driverless cars, won't have driverless cars for a long time, mm, mm. don't have robotics, and more importantly, don't have artificial intelligence. You know? So it, it's, a, it's a quantum leap in what happens from a, 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 a you know, condensed um, city yeah. compared to a, a regional community of, say, 500 people or 1,500 or 15,000. Yes. Now, um, if we look at what's happening today with regard to, as I mentioned earlier, the speeds that are capable, you know, um, 5G is a, a quantum leap in speed. However, for the applications that we predominantly use, whether it be video, whether it be you know um, using cloud services for your email and your, yes. your your presentations, your spreadsheets, your finance packages, all of your day to day operations from a, a, a small business, you know, or medium to large business, whatever, or a consumer layer, um, the network's already there and can measure it to handle such things as what we do on a day-to-day -day basis now. And even for the coming future, you know, the bandwidth requirements that come with um, a lot of the, the applications that I just mentioned, the driverless cars, etc., they do require large bandwidth. But there's yes. a long way to go because it's not just a matter of saying 5G's here, 5G's got lower latency that enables these things to be absolutely real time. So just on the latency aspect, um, 5G's got a latency rating of anywhere from, you know, 0, 0, 0 001 or, or a uh, 1 millisecond um, response time to a 4G network today that sits around 18 milliseconds. Right. So we're, we're talking absolutely blistering yeah. um, response totally times different. anyway, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Now, that, that's probably the key differentiator is the latency between 5G and 4G. So one, se one millisecond compared to 18 milliseconds on average. Now, the, the, the next aspect of 5G network, and more importantly, the coverage requirements to come with a 5G network, we're going to need a whole lot more um, cells yes. you know, or base stations to enable that. So it's one thing having a driverless car that drives down the road if the network's not there commensurate to provide continuous coverage at all times for that driverless or autonomous mm -hmm. vehicle to, to go about its business, then, you know, we, we've still got a lot of work to do. Yeah. And, and it's yeah. Not, not just us, but, you know, our the community. Yeah. Yeah. The um, whole community, the whole telco yeah. community, there's a lot of hype. But if you pull back from the headline and start looking in the detail, and, and I don't think, you know, um, the, the punter on the street doesn't, really understand those mm. comments that I just made. However, they do hear the highlight, uh, they do you know, read the headline or hear the, the, the headline and you know, all the hype and, and pomp and fare that it is about it. But I encourage people to actually take a step back 
and understand what what is really involved mm-hmm. in doing this. And more importantly, there's there's lots of information that's available on the web, and people can understand these things in their own space, their own pace, yes, and their own time. If you so, look at though, so say for instance, um, I as a farmer, um, I've got five or six combined harvesters. Yep. Um, the telematics involved of yep. the Internet of Things. Yep. That, that will be embraced and worked upon within 5G. Is that fair? Oh, that, that's a very uh, true statement. And, and not just that, they're doing it now. So right. 4G, so you get a, you know, a combine or a you know, broad acre header. You know, these things are, are autonomous now. Yes. Uh, previously, they were using you know, satellite um, delivery to actually do it. And that was giving them within half a metre accuracy. So with the 4G networks that we have today uh, in a lot of these areas, then... Um, these guys are doing it and they're getting down to, you know, yeah, one metre accuracy. Wow, yeah. So, you know, it's... it's um, One millimetre accuracy. One, one millimetre ac- yeah. accuracy. Yeah. So, you know, and they, they've all, you know, in today's world, they've still got, you know, they've got a, a, a guy or a girl sitting in the truck just in case something does go wrong that they yes. can take over. Um, but by and large, this, is, this has been happening for some time. So I, I can attest that... You know, John Deere and, you know, Massey's and all these types of manufacturers have had those programs available for in excess of 10 years. Wow. So, you know, there's there's adoption of, of those technologies, you know, on the land and yes. people are doing it because it's all about efficiency and how they can, you know, paddock to plate and, and get the yeah. best possible price that they can for, you know, whether it be mm-hmm. barley, wheat, whatever the commodity is that they're, that yeah. they're harvesting. Um, but it's not just that either, Declan. There's, um, there's other really cool things that come along with it so with the internet of things there's you know flow meters there's moisture density uh, uh, sensors there's um, beacons of you know limited by our imagination know. yeah exactly you know, right. but, but the real key ones are, it's generally about moisture it's generally about water uh, flow yes. rates where the groundwater is how they can keep the the harvest alive make sure yeah. make sure the crops in in good health um, and obviously, with the droughts that we're you know that we're involved in, and mm. you know, there's a lot of scorched earth out there, mm. uh, which mm. is when you're out there, it's it's heartbreaking stuff. And just on that, we got a bit of rain overnight, and that was which just is great, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And we got it most most of, most of the state cops on, so hopefully we get a bit more. But um, it always comes back to you know leaner, meaner, and more efficient. So mm. as the as the um, the cockies get more knowledgeable and, mm-hmm. and and more faith and confidence in the coverage of these networks whether it be three four or 5g uh, then that comes down to that uptake will be driven by uh, the ability to absolutely use these technologies with confidence um, at the moment hit and miss you know, yeah a lot of people that you know from, and it's back to confidence so the, the yeah. fear of engagement and the fear of not doing it so yes. You know, some farmers might be, you know, using it and using it to their advantage, but there may be other farmers that, you know, probably old school, a, a bit reluctant. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And more important, why do I need that? Why, mm. why should I use that? Um, just because Jimmy down the road's using it doesn't mean I have to, you know, yes. go and do that as well. But the other key aspects are, you know, what, what's this stuff cost? Yeah. Um, because previous to the infrastructure being available to them on such a scale that it is today and continuously improvement um there there is a a a hesitation there just purely on the cost involved so back to you know the first question was um what does my role entail my role entails education Mm. uh, and awareness to make sure these guys not only hear about it but understand it yeah see it Mm. try it um, you know, we do some proof of concepts around the place as well to, you know, bring on vendor partners that, yeah. that that's all they do. That, they specialise in that, you know. I won't name the vendor partners, but there are, there are quite a few uh, that we've got across the nation we work closely with. And um, by adding a, a, a SIM card to it onto our 4G network just provides enablement that, that the cocky just couldn't consider, you know, as recently as six months ago. You know, no, because well, they, no. they just didn't know. They just so, don't know. It's there. They just don't know. Yeah. And, and you, don't, you don't know what you don't know. So exactly you, you, right. You, you, there's no, there's no um, blame. There's no, um, there, it there's is no what backward it is. thinking. Yeah. It is what it is. And, yeah. and, and that's part of, you know, part of the role that I have is doing those information sessions in mm. these communities. And, you know, the, the more and more of these we do, the better, the better we're going to be and more importantly the the better outcome that uh, the customers are going to get at the end of it yeah yeah 
So um, Rob Seymour, General Manager, Regional South Australia. Uh, I've loved today's session. Um, and there's probably a couple of thank yous. Thank you for partnering with us and allowing us to support you in the regional areas. But most importantly, thank you from the regional areas for the work that you do uh, for evangelising and make it happen for them. Because without them, I don't think South Australia would be the place that it is. So Rob Seymour, thank you very much. Thanks, Declan.